1990s, early 2000s, fondly referred to as leadership councils at that time. The first grant was awarded in 2004, and in January 2020, collectively, the giving councils and circles of CFW surpassed $1 million in giving. The foundation's history began over a decade prior, though. Founded in 1985, CFW remains the only foundation in the region investing specifically in women and girls. At the time, only 3% of institutional philanthropic dollars were going specifically to benefit women and girls. Not much has changed to date, which is why the work of CFW remains crucial. At the foundation, we invest in women and girls as catalysts, building stronger communities for all. This mission is achieved by providing grant support to both emerging and established organizations, offering an innovative array of leadership development and capacity building programs, and advocating for underserved women, girls, trans, and gender non-binary people. The Giving Councils and Circles are a vital component of advancing this mission. They are community partners in identifying and investing in grassroots organizations trusting that those in communities know the needs and solutions. They are instrumental in broadening CFW's reach, cultivating ambassadors for gender and racial equity who amplify the needs, the messages, and the work of the grantees and of the foundation. They are an example of democratizing philanthropy, sharing and seeding power, again, trusting that those in and connected to the community know best. Together, we are building a network of engaged philanthropists redefining the relationship between funder and grantee, considering how to leverage this network to influence the ecosystem of support for community-based organizations. The Giving Councils of CFW are affinity-based groups that prioritize funding to emerging and community-led organizations with budgets of $500,000 or less. Members award grants of up to $7,500. The Giving Circles of CFW have a geographic focus within the Chicago region, awarding grants of up to $15,000. Within these geographic boundaries of the Southside Giving Circle, members target their investments to Black women-led organizations serving Black women and girls. The core model is the same for all of the Giving Councils and Circles, although each of them has a distinct, beautiful, and robust personality and culture reflective of membership and grant focus. Each giving council and circle has one grant cycle per year. Grant awards are funded through membership dues and member-led fundraising activities. Members lead the grant cycle, identifying organizations, reading proposals, attending site visits, and making funding recommendations. Members apply the foundation's grant framework plus their specific foci within this framework. CFW provides financial management, grants management, and operational support, as well as thought partnership and leadership development opportunities. CFW receives an administrative fee annually from each fund. Want to learn more? Want to donate to or join a giving council or circle of CFW? Check us out at www.cfw.org or contact Ellie Marsh, Director of Social and Community Impact at emarsh at cfw.org. We'd love to connect. Let's be thought partners in collective giving and uplifting community voice in decision-making. Hi, I'm Ellie Marsh, she, her, and hers, Director of Social and Community Impact at Chicago Foundation for Women. CFW has been hosting giving councils and circles since the early 2000s. And in January, 2020, Collectively, these groups are, have surpassed $1 million in giving to women, girls, trans, and gender non-binary people. In June 2021, they are all on track to invest between $150,000 and $200,000 in the Chicago region this fiscal year. I actually was a member of the LBTQ Giving Council for three years prior to joining staff in 2015. Therefore, as a member, I experienced the reward of being engaged with the Giving Circle. And as staff partnering with Giving Circles, I am shown frequently the power and the value of the members and their collective giving efforts. 
I'm really looking forward to this conversation with two of our Giving Council and Circle members at CFW. We're going to explore what has been working and what's been challenging about hosting and implementing Giving Circles. Whitney, Lauren, hi. Hey Ellie, hey Lauren, I'm Whitney Wade. Um, I am a program officer at the Robert R. McCormick Foundation here in Chicago professionally. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm one of four co-chairs on the Southside Giving Circle here at CFW that was started in 2018. Before that, I was a member of the Women United Giving Council for three years. The Southside Giving Circle focuses on organizations that are benefiting Black women and girls on the South Side and that are led by Black women on the South Side specifically. We fund small organizations and the threshold to us for small is budgets of 500,000 or less. And our grant making still aligns with the priorities that CFW has established that er Ellie covered earlier. So freedom from violence, economic security, access to healthcare and information. So our work um, is still aligns with the foundations. However, we focus on Southside area nonprofits specifically. And our nominations come from circle members who are usually very familiar with what those organizations are and who's doing programming on the South Side specifically. Thanks, Whitney. Lauren. Great, wonderful to be here with both of you, Whitney and Ellie. Uh, my name is Lauren Birchlove. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, in a professional capacity, I work for UCAN, which is a social, social services agency in Chicago um, as the director of corporate and foundation grants. I am the co-chair of the LBTQ Giving Council at Chicago Foundation for Women. Um, and we are a uh, giving council started in 2004. We have about, I would say, eight to 10 members. And similarly to um, you know, the Southside Giving Circle, we're an extension of Chicago Foundation for Women. So we also focus on providing grants for organizations that provide economic security, freedom from violence, and um, access to healthcare and healthcare information, uh, programs and services for L LGBTQ women, girls, and non-binary folks. So our focus is kind of on that population. I mean, again, similarly, uh, by and for is very important to us on the council. So we really look for representation amongst staff, amongst board members, and, and you know, really look for organizations and programs that have that reflection um, in their work. We also focus on really small grassroots organizations that are very kind of in the weeds of the work happening on the ground. And so having membership that represents those populations as well that are very familiar with the work and are often doing the work themselves. So working with those nonprofits in a volunteer capacity or working even for those nonprofits um, themselves uh, is a huge contributor to the work. So to date, we've awarded around 55 grants totaling to about $175,000. So modest, but powerful. Um, and learning is also a huge component of our work. So we do a lot of collective programming around learning and, and learning about the issues that are facing our community. Great. Thank you. Uh, Whitney, I'm going to pose the first question to you. In some of our conversations, you've spoken to giving circles challenging the norms of philanthropy. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so for example, um, Lauren is a professional fundraiser. I'm a professional grant maker. We both know, and of course, Ellie, you work at a foundation. Mm -hmm. We all know what institutional giving looks like. Um, and, and who are typically, what organizations are typically on the radar of large funders. And I think the smaller organizations that we fund, the organizations led by people of color that we fund, they typically don't have large development teams. You know, they may not have the capacity to be filling out complicated grant proposals and meeting all of these deadlines. Um, so I think we're capturing organizations that are just very different in terms of size, scope, who they serve, who's leading them, um, and we're able to provide funding to people who would typically not be on the radar of a large funder, for example, you know, so some of our grantees are, are really small, their entire budget may be fifty or $60,000. So a five or ten thousand dollar grant from our circle is is considerable for them, you know. Whereas in my work at the foundation, 
one grant may be fifty or sixty thousand dollars to a multi-million dollar social service agency, you know, or a much larger program. So these are the types of organizations that institutional donors typically don't know a lot about because they're not well connected. You know, they don't have board members who have the social capital to be connected to large funders. Um, and it's just a it's just a totally different environment and a different set of grantees that we work with. And as Lauren alluded to earlier, it's usually because the folks on the council and circle, we know people who are running these programs and who are operating these smaller organizations that kind of operate outside of the larger, bigger players that all of us know and see, especially here in Chicago. Yeah. And for the foundation as a host organization of giving councils and circles, one of the things that we recognize fully is that so many of the, the organizations that are funded by the Giving Councils and Circles are new to CFW, are ones that haven't been on our radar, that don't have relationships with staff yet, or even within a larger institutional funding community don't have access to that. Mm -hmm. And so even as a member of a Giving Council, one of the things that I thought was really important was the council and circle members ability to shine a light, light on and uplift these really vital community organizations. And in bringing them kind of in as a grantee then of CFW, having access to technical assistance and capacity building and leadership programming that the foundation provides, right, as well as, um, this is a word that I'd like to get away from. However, it's, I think that it will capture is this credibility of being funded by an institutional funder, right? A step in the door or a foot in the door, if you will, that if um, institutional funding isn't available to you as it's not for many women of color led organizations or trans led organizations, then having funding from an institutional funding funder helps in that process. And the Giving Councils and Circles have been instrumental in, in cracking that door open a little bit more for, for those groups. And then continuing to think about the ways that Giving Councils and Circles kind of challenge these norms of philanthropy. In previous conversations, you both have also talked about kind of flexibility as well as relationship. Would you tell us more about those things? I can jump in on that. So I think another, well, to, and to Ellie's point earlier about, I know credibility isn't the word you'd like to use. I understand why you're saying that though, but <laughs> it, it does bring, it does allow them to leverage institutional funding in a way that they may not have before. Yeah, we have, so we started out with about 30 or so members our first year in 2018. We made about 30 or so thousand, 30,000 plus in investments. Now we're up to 60 plus members. We've made more than 60,000 in grants uh, for 2020. I know that at least half of our grantees, CFW is the first foundation grant they've received. So, mm -hmm going through the process of applying for a foundation grant, seeing what the proposal looks like, what the process is, the response time, you know, just having experienced that cycle now better prepares them for, okay, when I see other funding opportunities in the future, I know what this looks like and mm -hmm. I know I can do this. And also because our members often have relationships with some of these organizations, you know, a lot of times these are women we know who are running and managing these programs. And for example, when the pandemic happened, a lot of small organizations, I think the entire sector was just assuming some people are just gonna close. If they're small, they may just yeah. go away, you know? So we were very worried about that funding small organizations and all of the co-chairs got together. You know, Ellie keeps us all together, thankfully. And we said, okay, well, let's split up and let's call each of our grantees and ask, you know, how are you doing? What's going on? What are your challenges? So I think the relationships that we have with our grantees, um, and I know people do that, you know, as, as a program officer at the foundation, I call grantees too and see how they're doing and check on it. But 
the level of concern and care that I have for a much smaller organization that somebody is running in addition to their full-time job is a lot different than a call I may place to a large, well-resourced organization that I know will probably be okay. You know, and when we had our grantee celebration, one of our grantees mentioned that, that we called mm -hmm. her and she said that she did not receive calls from other funders asking about how they were doing and if they were okay and what they needed. And, you know, she was very happy and pleased that we had that level of relationship with other Black women that she would expect a phone call from somebody just checking on her and to see how she's doing, not only as someone who runs this program, but just as a person who's taking on mm -hmm. all the emotional stress and pain from dealing with young, you know, young teenagers who are losing people, who are losing jobs, and who are trying to keep everything moving. So I think that's a deeper relationship piece that we have on the giving councils and circles that people may not have, you know, in other, in other types of giving situations. Yeah. Lauren, anything you'd like to offer right now? And to your question about um, flexibility, Ellie, um, and Whitney, I think this kind of dovetails off of your point about uh, or how, you, how your council responded to um, COVID, which by the way, you know, I can say in my professional capacity that I received those calls, right, from some of our funders, and I come from an agency that's quite large, and it felt, good, it felt great, right? And so I can only imagine you know, and you, here's something I'm going to write down in my playbook for my council for the future, right, is make some of those great calls, because I can only imagine how, how amazing it must have felt just to know. And those are the kinds of things that are so important for us to do as a council, right, is to be that extra added support. Um, I think about how the councils collectively came together and developed a rapid response fund for COVID-19. Um, so this was an effort um, on behalf of all the giving councils and circles at CFW. We all uh, mobilized resources very, very rapidly. I think it was within the span of a matter of weeks to evaluate um, a, a, an amount that each fund or circle and um, council would contribute to this rapid response fund. We went through a very prompt and um, decisive evaluation process. And then we mobilized the resources. Mm -hmm. And we did that because we saw the need and we just made it happen. And so that's the kind of flexibility that I think um, and fluidity that councils and circles can uh, manage and mobilize because we, we just, that there's not that sort of like rigidity of structure. We are able to kind of make, that, make those decisions um, uh, more easily. Um, and, and it was, a, I think, a, a very needed response. And it was a great experience to be able to collaborate and come together and that same benefit of kind of having different voices in the room and bringing those individual perspectives was incredibly beneficial throughout that process as well, because we were we were learning from each other, the different councils, uh, their communities and what their communities, you know, needed and, and um, you know, were, were experiencing. So that was just one example of flexibility and, and how we kind of can work within that, within that uh, fluidity. Yeah. yeah, that was, that was a really good experience. And I, I think it speaks to a larger point about changing how philanthropy works and that that is possible you know and we saw all over the cities I was speaking a, to a consultant recently who said that Chicago has one of the highest volumes of donor collaboratives she's seen okay. uh and just how people get together and put pooled funds together and and people are moving money really quickly foundations are increasing their payout this, this last year proves we can move faster, we can get more money out the door, we can make decisions a lot faster than we think we can, you know, and we don't have to, like you were saying, stick to these rigid processes just because that's the way it's always been done. And it, it shouldn't necessarily take an emergency to change our mindset around those things now that we know it's possible. So I think that that gives us some hope for how we can be more creative with with processes and systems as a field in general. Yeah, and as a, as a foundation, a host organization and a strong partner with the councils and circles, particularly in going through the rapid response fund in spring of 2020, this understanding that uh, as our role in providing grants management support and some operational support you know, on the back end, it's the members leading this 
And there is a role that the host organization has in supporting with kind of the coordination and um, what the disbursements look like. And as a foundation that works within a traditional institutional kind of philanthropic framework, also recognizing the ways in which we have to push back against some of those self-limiting um, thoughts and mm -hmm. actions around what does the grant process look like? And we saw that that sh showed up in other ways that um, funding was going out the door from other funding streams at CFW during that period of time, that it's not only through the giving councils and circles. However, as a host, just recognizing kind of the time and investment and care that's put in to sustaining the relationships with the councils and circles, and then your ability to be able to get your money and your funding out the door locally to these community organizations more quickly, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in thinking about how both of you talked about this core relationship that members have with, um, with grantees, and then one of the things as a host organization, um, recognizing was that in some ways we were still seen as gatekeepers yeah. of that relationship. Okay. And so um, acknowledging that that power dynamic still exists between funder and grantee, that giving counsel and circles are not immune from that and that there may be some questioning and maybe even some tension around you know, how can those then organic relationships between members and grantees happen without having kind of me as a staff representative kind of be the gatekeeper of those relationships. Um, and I know that that is something that is a work in progress for all of us kind of right now, um, but Recognizing that that is a work in progress, um, are there things that come to mind that have been maybe helpful or really rewarding in how you as members have been able to develop relationships with grantees? Yeah, I mean, I, I think of the opportunities that, and I mean, Ellie, I think this is, a, this is a credit to you as well as a credit to, to Chicago Foundation for Women, the opportunities that we've been given the LBTQ Giving Council uh, has been given to kind of cultivate our own events around, you know, panel discussions or um, any other sort of programming that's not explicitly grant, you know, grant related, but is grant all, almost always grantee driven, you know, giving our grantees an opportunity to have a platform, whether it's bringing a leadership, you know, uh, representative from their organization to speak or a volunteer, what have you, um, as an engagement tool. Um, and also kind of weave in issues that we care about to that. So, for example, earlier this year, the LBTQ Giving Council hosted a panel on um, community wellness, particularly around mental health. We featured a couple of a potential grantee um, and a past grantee. So that was just one example, I think, of Chicago Foundation Women just giving us the freedom to arrange that and also the support, right? The tech support to be able to host it, um, some guidance and advice on how to, you know, how to arrange it and, and you know, the, the program outline, all of that um, is just a, a great way to kind of feel like we have the autonomy, yet we have the support to be able to, to pull something like that off and make even an enriching experience. And also, you know, boosting it on Chicago Foundation for Women's social media platforms. So we have the amplification that way. So being able to kind of have that, that guidance and that support while also being able to kind of build our, I mean, for lack of a way, what better way to put it, build our own brand and build our own sort of public uh, image and, and who we want to show up as, as a, as a group and as a community resource is really powerful for sure. Great. Let's pivot a little bit and talk about membership, continuing along those lines. Um, what are some benefits of being a member? I can think I of lots. You know, yeah, I can go for it. Um, so, <laughs> and again, we are, we've grown in popularity majorly. So again, we started in 2018 with 30 or so members. Now we pretty much doubled in size. We have 60 or so members right now. 
And it is, and probably for all of the circles and councils, members, you know, come from a variety of backgrounds. So for us, we're the South Side Giving Circle. Both of our members either live, work, grew up on the South Side, or just care about what happens here. There are some people who work in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector professionally, and there are others who don't. So again, there are some people who know all about grant making and fundraising and how nonprofit programming works. And there are other people who they're coming to the circle because they, they want to know, you know, how does philanthropy work? This is something that I always thought was inaccessible to me because I don't work at a foundation. How can I become a philanthropist? How do I say that I'm a philanthropist? So I think people are starting to understand you don't have to have millions and millions of dollars to be considered a philanthropist, you know, and we know that the history of Black giving specifically is such that we do philanthropy every day in our churches, in our schools, with our friends, with our families, and our fraternal and social organizations. So for a lot of people, it, it gives them the experience of, okay, well, this is a professional field. I can learn grant making. I don't have to work at a foundation to learn how to do grant making and be a philanthropist. And for those of us who do work in the sector already, again, we get an opportunity to bring in some smaller organizations that we may not be able to see or interact with in our professional lives, because again, it's a, it's a totally different subset of organizations. And it's also a way for people to be connected to what goes on in their community and their neighborhoods in a different way, you know, for people who grew up here or for people who still live yeah. here and they want another way to be involved in what happens and what types of organizations are supported outside of what people typically tell you to do, you know, write your alderman or, or know who your elected officials are. Mm -hmm. There are other ways you can be involved in local neighborhood work by contributing your dollars directly. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't have to come through like political process. It's just, I think it's just a really unique volunteer opportunity for a lot of people. It's not it's not something that is typical. Giving circles are a large movement now, but I still think it's fairly new in comparison to the types of volunteer things people are used to doing. To doing, yeah. This is a lot different than that. So that's a huge opportunity for me. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I, I think that's probably true. I, you know, I'm, I'm making a, an assumption here. I think it's a safe one that there are not a lot of opportunities that are like this, particularly for the LGBTQ community in Chicago. I don't really know of any other large um, sort of queer affinity focused giving groups in the Chicago area. Um, so that in and of itself, I think is very significant that this is a community for you know, folks who identify as LGBTQ to really focus their giving around this population in these specific issue areas. Um, you know, speaking from individual experience, my experience, um, Chicago Foundation for Women has generously supported my growth as an individual through this participation in this council as a leader, right? So being, you know, involved in this council has given me opportunities to speak publicly about issues that I care about. Um, Chicago Foundation for Women has given me uh, an abundance of platforms to, you know, advocate on their behalf, you know, on behalf of the organizations that um, CFW invests in, you know, of course, we're in partnership together, right? So we invest in these organizations together. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I can't, I can't thank CFW enough for investing in me as a leader through the council and just through the broader CFW community. So I think members in general benefit just as through leadership development, through um, learning about the philanthropic process, learning about community engagement and what it really means to engage as a grantor, as a philanthropist, uh, because it is community leadership. Um, and you're, you know, you're really, you're learning about those power dynamics and how philanthropy really comes out, comes to play um, in building social movements and helping social movements advance and um, equity and what equity means, diversity, inclusion, how all of that plays a part um, and so that, that leadership development and that growth is a huge part. You know, giving is one, one piece of it, but there's so much more at play. And what about um, member recruitment and engagement? Um, kind of in previous conversations, and particularly both of you as chairs as we're thinking about this specifically, um, for your respective council and circle, um, there are things that have been working really well and there are times when it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. um, will you both speak a little bit to what that experience has been like? 
Yeah, this year has been a challenge for us, um, the LBTQ Giving Council. I think, you know, like many groups, I think this year engagement um, during the pandemic in a virtual environment has just been, it's, it's been really tough. Um, I think for what we've struggled with quantity, we've really made up for though in quality, right? Like when we do have the meetings that we have, deeply engaging, um, really not just deeply engaging conversations around what we're gonna do with, you know, the organizations that we're serving and our evaluations and all of that, but also what is driving us and really, really reflecting on the values uh, of why we're giving, um, of, of what we wanna bring to um, these social movements this year of, you know, also just connecting with one another and building community in this time of, I think, just where folks are really struggling to kind of maintain those connections and, and need to feel connected. Um, so that's what I'm getting a sense of. So looking ahead, my hope is that hopefully as things open up, we have more opportunities to connect with other groups, draw people in, have more of those types of panel discussions. You know, that the one we had earlier this year was very well received and we definitely got some inquiries. So the want is out there. The recruitment is a bit challenging. That's where our challenge has been is, you know, that I think um, it is a commitment, right? It is a commitment and it's, it's an intellectual commitment. It's an emotional commitment. It's more than just, here's a check, you know, I'm gonna go do my thing. We, we need that investment and that's what makes it an enriching experience. So um, hoping to find some folks on, at, you know, in the coming year who are really ready to kind of dig into a uh, philanthropic experience that is um, deeply engaging. So again, we've had a great experience recently and have doubled in size. So I think things are going great now for recruitment and engagement. I believe strongly that the nature of group work is such that there will always be a small group that does mm -hmm. most of the work. And then you'll have other people who kind of float in and out. So you'll always have some people who just want to donate and not, you know, not really come to any meetings. They may or may not do site visits and that's fine. You know, so that means you have to have a strong critical mass of people who are willing to kind of carry things forward. So now that we have 60 people, you know, that means we have at least 20, 30 who are always going to be engaged and always doing stuff. So that type of dynamic and formula works really well for us now. And even when we started, we started with 30 or so people. So we still had enough folks who were always there who were willing to do things. With much smaller councils and circles, that's tougher because if you only have, you know, five or six people doing everything, if somebody gets really busy at work, if somebody gets really busy with their kids, you know, it's difficult to kind of keep moving things forward. So we've had the conversations we're having with the Southside Giving Circle are, well, what happens if we double again? What does it look like if we get to 100 people or 150 people? How will the dynamic change? Will we need to change things about our process to keep people involved? You know, if, if there are too many people in a site visit, is it weird? <laughs> you know, how might that look if it becomes too large? Is there a such thing as too large? If our goal is to get as much money into the community as possible, how do we think about our process and, you know, keeping people engaged and making sure people know this is not just something else that you write a check to? Because for people who have means, there are a lot of things that they could just be writing a check to. So then it's it's back to Lauren's point about engagement and how do you let people know we do still want you to be involved mm -hmm. and and be active in this but so now that's what we're thinking about for the future is if we get larger if we get even larger how might the way we do our work need to change to keep people excited about what we're doing so that we don't go backward to where we have fewer people and then it's hard to keep people into the group. Yeah. Oh, thank you both so much. I think through this conversation and what we'd wanted to surface did in part was that when you know one giving circle, you know one giving circle, right? That the model um, that both of you are using in your respective council and circles is the same. And how that model then manifests and is implemented looks slightly different because the personality of each of your councils and council and circle is different. It's, it's representative of who you, 
who your membership is and where your grant dollars are going. And that for a host, what that means, and I had to learn this um, coming in initially with a mindset that as long as I had a structure and a time frame and one way of doing things, then all of you would just operate <laughs> all line and like clockwork. And at the end of the day, it's about the relationship. Yeah. Well, I do still think it's, it's, it is still very helpful as, as someone who has a, a lot of my work is project management throughout my entire career. I do think structure is important. I do think process is important. I do think it's important to have a baseline and start somewhere to give people some guidance. So it is very helpful to have you, Ellie, as like the central common denominator across all of the circles. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it gets overwhelming at times for you, uh, but it, it would probably cause confusion and chaos for CFW if there were two Ellie's, you know, because then there would be so many different things going on at once. So I, I do like that there is some centralization and some standardization mm -hmm. across councils and you can just change things as need be but there has to be somebody tying us to the organization you know there has to there have to be SOPs in a sense just to yeah. start with them. and with that I think too it also you know as a council I think you know when I when I hear Whitney talking about how they got too many members I'm sitting here thinking like well if you want to sound like a good <laughs> half of those over the LBG <laughs> council will take them it's sort of like you know you, you have this framework that's that in some cases I think is maybe in some ways is working uh, working better or, or so, some uh, some councils are maybe stronger in some areas than, than other councils might be. So it's like what we're working within the same framework. What are you doing within that framework that is working really well that perhaps our council can learn from and take yeah. back and be maximizing a little bit more that maybe we can be leveraging that we're not working on as strongly, we're not leveraging as strongly as we could be and could have different results. So that's what also continues to amaze me is watching what other councils are doing, it, it, we all kind of have the same foundation, right? But like the way that each each council and circle runs with that, I think just speaks volumes about all of the people that are involved in these councils, the leaders that are involved in these councils, like the template looks the same, right? Um, but the leaders that are involved just run with it in different ways and we all have opportunities to learn from each other. Uh, but it's definitely a good framework. So I'll get yeah. that. And Ellie, of course. Fantastic. That's a good point. That's a good point because I think, I think, and I'll share this, the LBTQ and the Young Women's Giving Council have much better events than we do, mm -hmm. given the number of members that they have. I remember, I think the Young Women's Giving Council put on a panel about for Equal Pay Day. That might have been last year or the year before. And it is so, and, and teaching women how to negotiate salary. Yeah. You know, that's the example of programming that is so very targeted, but speaks to their membership so specifically. Those are the types of opportunities that people in that council need. And it's a good recruitment tool, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and they have, they don't have nearly as many folks as we have to do that type of programming and look what they're able to pull off. That's amazing. Yeah. I think all of this um, really, culminates in a few like high level points that come to mind for me as a representative of CFW and a host organization kind of to think about and like things that are lessons learned that are still works in progress to varying degrees. But um, one really falling back on the importance of investing in the relationship that all of us are partners in this work. Two, just exactly what the two of you um, were saying and riffing on is uh, this dance between enabling an agency and what does like working within that framework look and feel like among and between the giving councils and circles. So understanding that there is a need, Whitney, like you said, that is really beneficial to providing a structure through which and clarity from which all of you 
are then able to take ownership to shape the work and shape your community and the impact that ultimately you want to be having, right? And there, for a host organization, what I see is really important is the clarification of roles and responsibilities, maybe, of what, as a foundation, we're taking on and providing and what, as councils and circles, you all are responsible for moving forward. Um, third, again, building off of this idea of structure and that it is important to have that, that we're not becoming overly reliant on it. Mm -hmm. right? Kind of thinking about my example of when I first got into the work, like I was coming from a position of being overly, overly reliant on that structure, that if that was in place, I could do my job, you all could do your grants, things would be great, right? And it's needed, but really looking at it though as this tool, mm -hmm. the structure is the tool for doing the work and it's not useful unless there are the valued and trusted relationships at the heart of what it is that we are doing. Yeah. Right? Um, and fourth, and this is one that I grapple with most at this moment, particularly as we have gone through the pandemic and have needed to think about other ways of doing work is leveraging technology. And again, not technology as a structure in and of itself, but as technology as a way of enhancing connections, enhancing the ability to share resources and knowledge and for this engagement piece of it. Um, and how do we do that? What are the, the, the platforms and the software and the technology that are available already mm -hmm. that could be utilized in a way to bring us together even more so? Um, and so kind of with that, then Lauren and Whitney as members in thinking about foundations who are just beginning to host giving circles or who may are just maybe just considering it, um, kind of to wrap up here, is there one or are there one or two things that you would want to share with these potential host organizations? I would say one of the best gifts that CFW gave me in this and um, in this whole process was was really understanding, and again, big credit to Ellie, I think, on this on this one, is really taking time at the beginning of my council experience as part of the training. It was it was a training that we had to go through to understand the power dynamics of being a grantor. And what that would be like when you're sitting in a room with a potential grantee and conducting that site visit. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to aid, engage in that type of process, really understanding the, again, the power dynamics that are at play when you're talking about wealth distribution, when you're talking about kind of what, putting yourself in the mindset of the organization and the, the resource, you know, challenges that they're facing and just really walking through the biases that can be at play um, you know, the, wh whether it be like affinity bias and also the issues around conflict of interest, like that educational piece is so important. It's important because of the, the like ethical implications of it all, right? But it's also an important part of understanding philanthropy and understanding the space that you're entering and um, just the, the, just the world of it all. And um, that process of it was really enriching for me and kind of helped me to appreciate it on a deeper level. So again, beyond just my values and what brought me to it and wanting to donate and caring about the organizations and all of that, really understanding what it meant to be a philanthropist and be entering that role was really, really valuable and made has, has made my experience as a giving council member feel it has, has, has a lot more weight to it now mm -hmm. with that training. So I would suggest that if you were to endeavor, you know, into creating a giving circle, make sure that some sort of training like that or introduction into philanthropy or what have you is part of your model as a training component. Definitely. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I think that that's really helpful. Um, I would also say, so before I did grant making professionally, I did talent acquisition. So I care a lot about 
people management in organizations. So I think it's really important to remind anyone who's thinking about hosting that CFW has Ellie, a full-time dedicated staff person mm -hmm. specifically for giving councils and circles. I think it's really important to give the resources necessary. CFW now has, what, seven giving circles and councils. Yeah. And just because these are volunteers, you know, that does not mean that the work takes less time or requires less effort it's still a lot to manage. So I think it's really important to have somebody with enough capacity to keep up with all of this, again, because of the relationships that we have with her and the buffer that she operates as between the organization, us, grantees, the board. So I think having that staff person is really important. Another thing I'll say is that I really like how accessible all of CFW is to mm -hmm. us as giving councils and circles. Um, and that's partly, again, because of Ellie. You know, Ellie sends out and uses technology and her communication tools to make sure all of the councils and circles know what's going on with the others. That's how I know who's having what events, who's doing what. I'm not sure if other people operate that way or if their circles and councils are just operating in silos. I feel like we have a lot more connection with each other, like with the Rapid Response Fund. I met people in other circles and councils I had never interacted with before at social events, at CFW's luncheon, I get to meet and interact with people. I've met and interacted with people on CFW's board. Usually board leadership is viewed as totally inaccessible in the nonprofit sector. You know, a lot of times you don't see or meet people at that level at all. So, and I have good working relationships with some of these folks who are, you know, again, they're regular people, but usually there's a power dynamic there too with, with board leadership at the nonprofit, at nonprofit. So I think CFW does a great job of making people feel connected to the entire organization and not just an offshoot that's doing their own thing over there. You know, it's, there's a lot more effort and care given to you're still a part of the CFW family and let's all figure out how we can keep keep up with each other and know what everyone else is doing. And I think that that's part of what makes it really unique as a foundation. Whitney and Lauren, thank you so much for sharing this space with me. Um, I always love talking with you and planning with you and doing the work with you. I think that um, you are just two of many examples of why this work feeds my soul and really of underscoring the power of community investing in community. Um, and I'm excited to continue to do, uh, to do this work with the two of you. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. And, yeah. Um, we'd love to do this work with any of you watching as well. So again, um, connect with us. It's at cfw.org. My email address is emarsh at cfw.org. Um, we want to be doing this work together with community, by community, for community. Thank you. Thank you.